is absolutely critical for our point in time. And so I'm just in a place where I can look at all those things together and, uh, and I'm so glad to be here to, uh, for you to do that with you. I have a presentation that uh, I want to share with you and I'll explain how this will work. There, uh, it's based upon certain elements of the book uh, called The Worship Architect and it is available in the bookstore here as well as the sequel to it that I wrote, it's published by Baker. And uh, basically this book looks at how to uh, think about worship and how to do worship, both in terms of services and uh, execution of the leadership. But it does so what I would call trans-stylistically. Uh, that book, I really think it was my desire to, uh, to not come at this from a stylistic thing, but to ask them the fundamental questions about worship. I do think style matters. Uh, one of my sessions today is not about style per se, although tomorrow we will talk about the music of worship, uh, in which that kind of factors in. But essentially my question is, can we talk about worship and not talk about style for the moment? Because style is as important as it is, and I would never make the claim that it's not important. It is important, but it's not the most important. And so we want to ask the more important things and to get our footing. So I used the metaphor of an architect, a building architect. I'm not an architect, but I did a little research with architects and just kind of um, asked them to educate me about their, their processes and a little bit of their vocabulary. And then I found that it might be a useful one metaphor for how we go about uh, planning and or preparing worship. And so I can just simply use that metaphor. Today, uh, these are contiguous sessions, although I do believe that if someone else wanted to join us, they wouldn't be lost uh, in, in the afternoon. So this morning, the worship architect, especially laying the foundations uh, of biblical worship. And then this afternoon, uh, what we, uh, in the two sessions following, we'll cover the, uh, the Christ-centeredness of worship, something that I'm extremely passionate about, something that I think we need to reclaim as the church, and I'll explain that, because I think most of us would say that we are, but um, I might want to challenge you to the degree that you are. And then framing the service, talking about just the grand movements of the service, not the micromanagement, not where does the offering go, not where does the special music go, not where does the not-so-special music go. <laughs> But, you know, that's for you to do. But, but to make the case that something is underway here that has a general shape to it, and not to advocate, uh, I'll do this in that session this afternoon, not to advocate that, um, that to have a shape for shape's sake, but I'm going to actually argue that the shape of it itself communicates something. And I'm going to say the shape isn't neutral. And so I hope I've piqued your interest. When I say the shape, I'm talking about the large movements of the service. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest they're not neutral. And uh, so if that intrigues you, then I'll see you at the third session today. But uh, all of this is sort of uh, worship architect driven kind of metaphor. But I hope it helps you. Uh, I, I love sharing, and I know that this is an hour. I can put it at nine. Is that correct? Okay, and I'll be faithful to that, I'll go nine. In the course of things, it honestly, and I really mean this, if you have a question or a thought for the good of the order, please interrupt me. You, you might have to wave your arms wildly to get me stopped. But do that, because this is your session. Uh, it's not just me hammering at you, but I'm happy to share you know, some things. But I want you to feel free to stop me, to, to contest, push back, do what you need to do. And, but I'm here uh, until tomorrow, so I can always keep that in a normal moment here and then as well. Uh, a, a disclaimer before I get started here. Uh, I don't think there is any master template for worship, and so I don't teach one. I think worship is contextual. I think that it's important that we claim the biblical, fundamental, necessary aspects of worship that can be translated into many different contexts. And I'm going to give you a couple of practical suggestions as we go along as well. 
And uh, I want also to know that we'll talk about worship design in the end. Worship design is not really a plan, a plan on paper, as much as it is a guide to a relationship. And I'm going to be talking more about that. So I'm not here to, to say, you know, a perfect worship design. I do a lot of work in worship design. But I'm not here to say that there's, you know, that that's what matters. But what matters about the design is that it, it guides God and God's people in relationship. That's it's a plan for a conversation. And uh, I think that will be coming to your appearance. And lastly, I'm going to use the word worship leader quite a bit. But why well, I want you to know how I'm using the term. I'm using it more broadly than to refer to the musicians. So when I speak of worship leadership, I will be meaning not the, only the musicians on stage or the chancel area, but I will be meaning anyone who has any responsibility for worship. That could be tech people, I hope pastors, um, ushers, readers, hospitality people, uh, arts, other arts invested. If you have any uh, responsibility, vocational pay, unpaid, volunteer, whatever, in the endeavor of weekly worship in your congregation, I call you a worship leader. So when I use that term, try to think broadly about the term as I'm thinking about that term. So let's begin uh, in a place that, just talking about the metaphor for a moment here. Um, good worship design is really all about facilitating a relationship, and that will become more apparent as we go. You know, if you just take a real cursory look at what it means to be an architect, I found these things that an architect does. Uh, they study the landscape, they look at the purpose of the building, I think this might be on your handout as well. They have conversations with those who are going to use the building. Like, is this going to be an elementary school, a law office, a warehouse, and how is that space used? They create a concept or draw a picture. They lay the foundations of the building, uh, including the cornerstone, we'll come back to that. Frame the building, install load-bearing walls to carry the weight of the building, so that what happens inside the building is structurally safe. Cut out doors and windows to let in light, access, and so forth. Uh, and then place the roof on the building. I mean, in a very simplistic layout. And I started to think about worship architects and how similarly uh, that occurs for us. I think you can put most of these up quickly. Study the church landscape, the culture around us, the neighborhood. I mean, for planning worship, that would be one of the first things I would do is to look around and say, who is my neighbor? To look at the purpose of worship. Now, this might seem bizarre, but I know that there are many churches, good meaning churches, who have never ever asked the question, what is the purpose of worship? They've never really asked it or answered it. They've assumed something. But I might challenge you today to actually ask and wrestle with this one question. Because the answer to that question will change everything. Will just change everything. Uh, worship architects have conversations with those facilitating worship. They create a, a concept or a design for the service. We lay the foundation into the service. We set the cornerstone, which I'm going to argue uh, is something new. Christ, we frame the service. We install load bearing laws, and by that I'm referring to now the large movements of worship. In other words, a few posts along the way that give us a reference point for the conversation between God and people. I'm going to lay all this out and just let you know where I'm headed here. And uh, we install doors and windows, and sometimes I think of those as prayers, songs, the means through which we access God and others, through which light comes in on our worship, so to speak. And um, I just make, I kind of laugh about this, but leave, well, when I say leave the roof off, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, I've come in, in the last number of years to understand, and I, I was pretty naive, nobody really shared this with me, but maybe in the last 10 years or so, I started to do a lot more reading about the idea of eternal worship and how worship is always ongoing. There's never a moment when worship is not occurring. And if you are from the Orthodox tradition, you're really well acquainted with this idea that worship here 
purchase with worship in the heavenlies, even at this moment, that is ongoing. So I let me say leave it above. It's just an idea to say, you know, what we do in, in any given local church uh, is a part, a part of what's going on anyway. So it's just, just a way of thinking about it in that way. So I'd love to use your, our imaginations together today and just enlarge the view of worship, enlarge the view of the worship planner to kind of catch a larger vision and, uh, and away we will go. This idea of the metaphor, of course, is pretty strong in scripture. Um, we have the passage of Hebrews 3, 4, every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is, scripture says, is God. God's really the builder, so we call ourselves the architects, we're, we're agents of what God is doing. Uh, Hebrews 3, 3, the builder of the house is more honored than the house itself. Hebrews 11, 10, uh, as worship architects, we are creating something that takes place now, here and now, but again, we look forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So this imagery of an architect is, is not foreign, certainly, to scripture, and it's just fun to play with it a little bit in terms of our purposes here to help us. Let's talk about the architectural concept itself. Um, worship architects understand that the purpose of a worship service is necessary so that they can create a, uh, an opportunity for appropriate worship actions to take place. And the first thing that I would like to just lay out here, which I've already alluded to, is simply this. Deciding upon the purpose of the Lord's Day of Worship or any primary weekend service that you have, and I understand and welcome that there's Saturday night services, Sunday night services, Sunday morning. So when I talk about uh, Lord's Day worship, I'm referring to the classic Sunday worship, but I mean any primary normal worship of your church. Uh, the, the first step, step to take is really to ask this question. What is the purpose of a corporate service of worship? What is the purpose? Now, if, again, I'm pretty sure in this crowd each one of us would have an answer. But I'd like to take what your first answer would be and challenge you this week to really turn that over and upside down and all around and start to look at that uh, carefully, the purpose of worship. The second part of that is, well, is actually more important to me. And here's the, the second part of that question. Where does our purpose come from? Let's assume there is a purpose for Christian worship, which of course there is. I want to know, where does that purpose come from? Who gets to say this is the purpose? You understand what I'm asking? Because if I went to one group in my church who said, what is the purpose of worship, there, I'm going to hear something. If I go to another group in my church and say, what is the purpose of worship, I might hear something else. And I could keep going with that one. And if I went to my supervisor or district superintendent or um, the head of the Texas, whatever you call it, Southern Baptist Convention music person, and say, what is the purpose of worship, um, I might hear something else. So I want to know who gets to, to say what the purpose of worship is. The purpose of worship is for each, here's my, what I'm going to propose to you, I think it's on the slide here. The purpose of worship is for each called community, a local church, a community instituted and constituted by God, to keep, get this, to keep public and corporate covenant relationship with the triune God. To keep corporate and public covenant relationship with the triune God. And the way this transpires is by way of conversation between God and people. Now, that's a pretty loaded definition. Because it's assuming corporate which scripturally is necessary 
for the worship. Meaning that there's a community. Meaning that we're not talking about private devos at the moment, as critical as those are. But we're saying there is an entity by which the people of God have a duty, a joyous duty, a holy duty, and that together worship happens and public worship. You know, every time that any church opens its doors for people to gather to worship the triune God, it is a public statement of faith. It's a public statement of faith. Today, if we were in Iraq, we would have trouble making a public statement of faith by gathering. There might be a letter on our roofs. And if you've listened to the news lately, you know what I'm talking about. A target. Do not underestimate the power of the witness of a gathering community. Just by, not by, not by verbal witness. But cars in the parking lot, a door open, people coming in and sitting down, is a statement about a relationship between God and people that is necessary because for that very reason that it's in public. That Christians can be identified one way in that very manner. Coming to church signifies there's, there are Christians in this world. And if we don't know that from the way we live, shame on us. But if we can at least point to pockets of gatherings and say, people gathered in covenant relationship with God is a signal that we even exist. Pretty powerful. The purpose of worship, then, um, is, in, is to keep covenant relationship. I'll say more about that in the second hour today. As believers, we meet with one another and with God to proclaim the story of God. I want to explain what I mean by the story of God. I will. They proclaim the story of God through words and actions. And when they do, when we, we proclaim the truth of that story, what is the story of God? I'm going to make this very simple. The story of God isn't necessarily just the gospel message of the narrow gospel message of I'm a sinner, Jesus died, Jesus saved me, I'm going to heaven. That's one part of the gospel. But the story of God is that simply this. Whatever God has done, is doing, and will do is the story of God. Let me say that again. Whatever God has done, Whatever God is doing, whatever God will do, is the story of God. That's why the story of God is a very sweeping narrative. And that story of God goes from creation to recreation. It's like you could say, it's whatever God is up to. Past, present, and future. And so in worship, we proclaim that story. We celebrate that story. We say that when people love this story, that chapters of this story are unrolling. Final chapter hasn't arrived yet. So God's still doing. And all of that's the story of God. Actually, you know, depending on your tradition, uh, I know that there's a mix of denominations in the room. So I think it's a great thing. Depending on your tradition, you may, you may have a fairly lengthy uh, Lord's Supper prayer. If you do, I bet if you went and looked at that, the classic Eucharistic prayers or Lord's Supper prayers historically are pretty lengthy. And it's the story of God. And it starts with creation. And it marks that throughout the prayers, the prayer goes along. How we fell away and our love failed, but God's love remains steadfast. How God sent prophets, how God delivered Israel. How God sent Jesus Christ, and on and on and on it goes. Story of God. 
It's also one, one great reason to celebrate the Christian year. It's because if you really do celebrate the Christian year, you're probably going to get a wider idea of the story of God. A wider idea of what God has been doing and is doing and will do. Uh, so, all of that to say, the story of God in worship is the fundamental content of worship. And as we gather, we're addressed by God, and we respond to God and surrender, and we're recommissioned to serve God's purposes so that the kingdom is realized. All this takes place in worship. Just by asking the question of purpose. Again, the purpose. A local church keeping public and corporate covenant relationship with God. Holding a meeting for the purpose of saying we're still your people. We're here. We're here to tell you that. Again, I'll elaborate a little bit more on later. And all of this is done through the presence of God's Son, the risen Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who enables the community to truly fulfill the purpose of worship. So all of this is done in, through, and with the risen Lord, who is truly present and um, in the afternoon session today, I've already told you this. Um, I, I should come with a warning sign. It says, watch out. This, you know, she gets emotional at this point. But um, I wonder, we really need to unwrap what it means to say Christocentric worship. Really need to ask, uh, what is the role of Jesus Christ in our worship? And this is something, that, again, that has been a growth edge for me over the last number of years. But it does change our understanding of who Christ is among us in worship, in public worship, changes everything. I mean, it, is, it just dramatically changes everything. So, you can say the purpose of worship is to fulfill our vows to be God's people. Fulfill our vows. And that when we're gathered, we proclaim God's story. Essentially, worship is a means to maintain vital relationship with God and God's people. But it's important to remember that the purpose of worship is from God. That worship has to be and do what God says it should be and do. Again, that's a no-brainer. There's only one problem. Most of us have made some assumptions about what God wants to be done. Most of us have made some assumptions about what worship should be. And I think they need re-examination big time. Because I think for a long time, we have been presuming some things. And now is the time to, to stop and say, uh, if God were to answer this question, what would it be? And how would I know? I should tell you that uh, I don't know any better place to go for the answers to that than in the scriptures. And so I think, you know, for me, it's hugely important that worship is scripture-based. At the same time, I'm not talking about pre-testing and finding our favorite Bible verses to wham around at one another, but to honestly ask this question. And I, would, I if, you, if you could do this after this first session, I would be a very happy person. If you could ask the question, what are God's expectations for worship according to the scriptures? And if you could identify those, you would be so far along. So far along. Because now, I'm, I'm deeply interested. I, I personally, I am deeply interested in what God says worship has to be and do. And then, I'm personally convicted if I've been making it something else out of my own desires, out of making it into my own image, only to find out God has something else in mind. And I'll just go ahead and ask you a hard question that I don't want your answer to. So it is rhetorical in this sense, but it's an important question. The last two years, pretty much wherever I've been teaching or speaking, I've been asking this question, I want you to contemplate it. Here it is. What would I do in worship? Because it was the right thing to do, regardless of what it cost me. What would I do in worship because it was the right thing to do, regardless of what it cost me? In other words, what would I do in worship, and by the right thing to do, I mean, 
my best understanding of what God expects out of worship. That's what I mean by the right thing to do. So if I if I conclude that God has some best of interest in what this event should look like and do and be, then I want to know that the best that I can, simply the best that I can. That's all. That's all I can do, right? Faithfully read the scripture, study, pray, be in conversation. I'm just going to faithfully do the best I can to discover what God is doing. And what if I discovered that God's purposes for worship stood over and against the ones that I had been assuming? And would I be willing to do the right thing, meaning God's expectations, even if it meant, ah, there might be fewer people coming, ah,
whatever, by clergy, musicians, whoever's on the stage up front, the prepared performers, to, uh, to do their thing that the congregation as an audience watches. And that God has set this holy prompter off stage, this unseen presence that, that coaches the clergy and the musicians in just the right manner, whispers in stuff like, sing that song one more time. They're really into it. Or, or pray now so the band can get off and home alone. Um, or, you know, whatever that is. And God's this holy whisper from outside. And here, here you guys, as you know, this, this is uh, how church is looking. And nothing could be more unbiblical than that model. And I completely agree. So we need to shift all this around. And uh, what happens now is we have a, a uh, redistribution, so to speak, of the characters. Now the congregation are the performers, the worshiper, the worship bees, the worker bees, the ones who are doing the work of worship, the clergy, musicians, whoever it happens to be up front, are the coaches, the ones who exhort, who urge, who do only what's necessary to help the congregation itself do the, the hard and beautiful work of worship. And of course that leaves God as the audience. And God is the one who gets to decide if this was uh, acceptable worship or not. You know the role of the audience, don't you? The role of the audience in our culture is to decide uh, what was good or bad, what was acceptable or not. And so I think about yourself in any audience situation. How are you going to express whether or not what was performed gave you inspiration or pleasure? You clap, you give a standing ovation, you cheer, or you throw tomatoes, or you boo. But ultimately, the audience is the judge. And what we're saying here is that ultimately, God is the one who assesses the credibility of the service, because ultimately, worship is for God. The one breakdown in this, art, in this little paradigm that I don't, that I think is a little weak, is is the fact that it doesn't account for the fact of the horizontal relationship between uh, people, which I think is very, very strong in worship. But I still think it helps it helps us to see that there's some turning on the head, there's some upside down rearranging of the walls that are really necessary. Now let's define worship. I'm coming up to this uh, now, and I will give you one definition. I like this definition. Again, there's no perfect definition. I use this a lot. It's written by Robert Shaper, maybe on your handout. He uh, died he, um, a few years ago. He taught at Fuller Seminary. It, is it, it's not in your handout, isn't it? Will you read it with me? Worship is the expression of a relationship in which God the Father reveals himself and his love in Christ, and by his Holy Spirit administers grace to which we respond. Sat down at the table and I 
I said, what question would you like to ask me? One of my students asked him about one of the most profound questions I heard. You know, to me, a good question is, is great, better than even a good answer. I mean, just having the right questions. One of my students said, Dr. Weber, how do you know when you have worshipped? Is that a great question? Because a lot of our people would say, well, I really felt this guy. Or I love that music. Or, you know, wow, that, that choir just sent me into the roof. Well, that could mean anything, actually, if the choir sent you into the roof. But, <laughs> <laughs> but here was his, his answer. His answer was quick. He said, you know when you have worshipped if you find that you are living in ever-increasing obedience to God? The degree to which you are finding yourself obeying God is a pretty strong indicator that you've really been worshipped. And conversely, if you are not growing in obedience to God, you probably better take a hard look at your worship. Because worship will always take you to greater true worship, to greater obedience. So I like that definition for this reason. <clears throat> Notice how this resonates with Baptist scholar Franklin Segler. Can I get a beret <laughs> somewhere? Who, um, Stan, because I know you, I can use your name, Claudia. Will you read this for us? God will be served for God's glory alone, not as a means to an end. While genuine worship may cause persons to be drawn into a church's fellowship, worship, not church growth, must be the church's priority. At all costs, churches must resist the temptation. But asking the right questions. 
one of my friends is a pastor in South Carolina, and he was, uh, I hope that this is nobody here in the room, but, but if so, you can, <laughs> don't let me know. Uh, <laughs> but he was saying that on Father's Day, there was a large church in his town, it wasn't his church, that uh, was giving away a Jeep to get people to church, fathers. And so fathers came to church, they got they were issued a ticket when they came in the door, and they had the right number. When I was in Jacksonville at that same time, one of my students went to visit a church that Sunday morning this year. And uh, it was Father's Day Sunday. And I know the name of the church, it doesn't matter, but I had not been to that church. But he came back to class the next day and he was sharing with the class that, um, that at this church, and this is the Tractional Church, so, uh, they had all the fathers, they had contests during worship for the fathers. So they would have like, Father would have his beard, and people would be them and they would rise. Father with, you know, the most children or whatever. And one of them was a push-up contest on stage, in which father could do the most push-ups. And the winner of that prize uh, got to sit in a massage chair on stage while the pastor preached. Now, this is what I'm talking about being a tractional church. But be careful, because though we don't have a massage chair, I hope, on stage, uh, as, a, as a prize, um, there are things that we do um, in our own settings before we know them. I don't think any of us are ill-intended. I think that we have become so saturated with our way of thinking that we're, that we're just, you know, it's happening without our anymore. Now, before 9 o'clock, I have 10 so, is that right? Okay. Um, I would like to do this to what I would call pouring the footing with this architectural motif. And I would like to share with you three footings for worship. And I've discovered that you can't lay a foundation until you lay a footing. Actually, the footing is what anchors the foundation of the world. So what we're talking about here is the most fundamental piece we can think about worship. And here they are. Number one, first footing, worship is grounded in God. Christian worship begins with reflection on who God is rather than a God reflection of who we are. It begins there. We matter, but we're not the beginning. The revelation of God's nature forms the basis for all Christian worship. We don't set forth what we want to do and then ask God to come on board, and we don't measure the success of our services based on our preferences. Instead, we say, who is God? Who has God revealed himself to me? What is his nature? What is his character? And that gets named first. This is the God. The God revealed to us in scripture. The God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Grounded in who God is. The very substance and nature of God, of the triune God. Secondly, footing. And one gentleman already mentioned this. God initiates worship. I gotta tell you, this is huge. This is huge for our understanding. God invites us to worship. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the who? The fish. Because the Father seeks those. Worship. The Father is seeking worship. It's God initiated. God seeks us. We don't create worship. We respond to God's self-revelation. If our entrance into worship is a result of God's invitation, how does that change things? I want to ask that again. If our entrance into worship is a result of God's invitation, how does that change things? It changes the way we begin the service. It changes the opening words of the event. Now, I get to proclaim as a worship leader, God is here. God has called us. Welcome. To an event. In which his son is here. Present to us, and our God is welcome in you. 
this season. And that's really different than a lot of big opening sentences I hear in worship today. Stuff like, hey, it's so great to be together today. Welcome, love to have you here. Get some coffee, come on in. Opening words. It changes the way we anticipate the service. Because now I understand that God has called me to church. I didn't decide if I want to go or not, if I have enough time or not, if I've been there enough times so to go to my mission. But now I'm coming as a response to God's invitation. That changes that. The degree to which I participate changes. Because if God is summoning me, God has called me, I'm going to invest in this. Because it's not the pastor who called me, it's God. We do not generate worship, God does. God approaches us, God calls us, God invites us to a holy meeting, just as he did the nation of Israel. All the time in the Old Testament, you'll hear the word convocation, God convoked. God called the group, up here please, and they did. And that is Christian worship now, up here please. Uh, about, let's see, probably about two years ago, I was in my office at the Indiana Bus Lane and I got a phone call from a guy named Jonathan that I've never met. I have since met him. And he's a worship pastor at a large contemporary mega church here in Charlotte, North Carolina. They have about 4,000 on Sunday morning. They have three different venues. And he said, uh, I'm the worship leader, but I have a full time worship leader at each of these venues. And uh, they, they happen to be young men. I, I've seen this not several of them. They're probably, I mean, I've seen around 30 years old, each of them, but Jonathan's maybe 45 ish. And so he's over them. And he said, I wanted to do some training with them. I came across the Aqua Worship Architect. And we've been studying that as worship pastors. And we've been going through it chapter by chapter. And I'm so thankful. A number of churches are using A lot of churches are using it as a study guide uh, for these matters. And he said, we've been studying it, and we've got some questions. Would you do a conference call with us? So we can just have some time with you. So we set it up. I said, I'd love to do it. Set it up. Had a wonderful conference call with these guys. Jonathan and his three young leaders. At the end of the conference call, uh, I loved it, and I just enjoyed it so much. They were very thoughtful. They said, I, I said to them, what one thing in the worship architect did you read that has really uh, challenged you the most or helped you the most? And, and they all agreed and said to me, the one thing that we had never considered was that God initiates worship. We had never thought about it. We had never considered that or what ramifications that would hold for us. And they were really thoughtful. And I said, well, how, how has that changed what you do? And here's exactly what they said. They said, well, you know, we used to start by saying, hey, great to be together. Let's get started with a few tunes. Welcome, get comfortable. You're going to have a good day. I said, now what do you do? He said, well, now we step forward and we say, you're here because God wants you here this morning. God is here. God has called us to this place. And together, we're going to discover God's presence. It's going to be a joyful day. He said it changed everything. It got about as quiet as it just did here in the room. These are very different things. Very, very different things. Lastly, and then um, I think we'll get time, as far as putting those is, as far as puttings go, <laughs> their worship grounded in God is an eternal one. You see, this worship, <clears throat> this worship thing has never been unhappening. Job 38, 7 tells us that there was worship before human creation. Eternal worship. Ephesians 1.12, Romans 12.1 indicates that worship is going on right now, that we live for the praise of His glory. That we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And the word there is worship as the verse concludes, which is our spiritual worship. It is what will continue in the heavens forever, Revelation 5. 11 and 12. It's how we're going to spend eternity. Worship is always, all at once, past, present, and future. It is an ongoing thing, and every Sunday morning, Saturday night, whenever it is for you, your church, big, small, men between, steps into something that is already underway. 
45 and end at 12. It's all there. But now is my time, our time as a church, to step in, <clears throat> add our voices to the wonderful, glorious worship ongoing. Go our way. Help pick up our string next week. That's the idea. All around our earthly globe, at the same time, with a consciousness that around the throne this day there is not a gap of the praise. A.W. Tozier said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. As no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. What he means by that is the things we fail to say about God, the things we fail to say about this event, are as telling as what we say. Example. I know lots of churches, lots of churches, who have eliminated intercessory prayer in worship. Why? Well, only one reason that I've heard. We don't have time. Why? Because we need this much time for the singing, and we need this much time for the preaching, and there's not enough time. What is left unsaid about God when intercessory prayer is eliminated? Think about that. As an example of something left unsaid. Would we want people to believe that God hears our prayers? That God can be a God we pray to? That God cares? That God welcomes the burdens of our souls? I think we would all believe those things, but once we decided by our intercession, we just said, let all those things unsaid. Now we're back to saying, what would I do right? Because it was God's expectation for worship. Even if it cost me something, even if I had to preach less, even if I had to cut out some songs of the band, the choir, would I be willing to put intercessory prayer back in? Because it was right. These are the kinds of things. The kinds of things that God just asks us to re-examine in this hour of the church. I'm really, I want this, I want you so badly. To, to do what is necessary to make worship the event that God seems to want in your life first. We are going to uh, have nine o'clock, but before we do, I have a job for you. So, in, around you, here's a slide. How would pouring this pudding change anything for you in, in your church as you plan worship. If you don't plan worship, pretend. And what I mean by that is here are the three footings. Worship begins with reflecting on who God is, not on who we are. Worship is initiated by God. And worship is an eternal enterprise. Two minutes. Talk. And then I'll conclude.
conversation over coffee, I hope. Uh, but at the first afternoon session, uh, we will, in this room, I will go through the crisis, the cornerstone of worship, and some of the foundations of worship, i.e., worship is Trinitarian, worship is covenantal, subsequent Muslim nations, uh, and then there's our other sessions. So it's been great to be with you, and I'll look forward to this afternoon.